why would we want to stop following it? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, the Republicans ran uh, in part on uh, the idea of repealing and replacing Obamacare. We had, when Republicans took over the House, we had the, the repeal vote. Obviously, you have the votes in the Senate. Uh, but we've heard a lot less about the replace part, other than scattered plans floating around. We haven't seen really a unified Republican effort to get behind the replace plan. Why is that, and is that going to change this year? I think that's actually a very valid criticism. I think one of the reasons why is because so many issues came up, and there's only so much time you know, to deal with all of them. So you have the debt limit debate. You've had uh, some other issues that have arisen that have kind of taken its place, but I think you're absolutely right. And one of the things that we need to be able to do if we want, if we're going to make the argument to the American people that somehow we should replace Barack Obama with someone from the Republican Party, one of the things we're going to have to acknowledge is that there is a health insurance problem in America and that it needs to be addressed, that Obamacare is not the right way to address it, but there, that this is here as an alternative. And there are some ideas that are well established out there, whether it's the ability of individuals to access health insurance with the same tax benefits that their employer does whether we create mechanisms where small businesses can pool together and buy insurance for their collective employees, whether it's the ability to buy insurance across state lines, whether it's creating incentives for states to take on the issue of tort reform and malpractice insurance reform. Uh, all of these are things that we should be for and be proactive about. And there may be a Republican bill filed on that issue. One of the things I noticed in this town is that you can file the bills you want, then get a lot of attention from the media. They ignore it and they focus because the Senate's controlled by the Democrats. And, and Senator Reid, who controls what comes to the floor, and, and as a result, what gets coverage in the mainstream media. Mm -hmm. The White House says it has no opinion on whether the Senate should pass a budget. Um, that was from Jay Carney yesterday. What's your response to the White House? I'm not surprised, um, <laughs> the, because the President's never offered a real budget um, either. And uh, budgets require you to make decisions. Budget requires you to show your priorities, and this President He's, he's in full re-elect mode. And when you offer a budget, that means you're going to pay for some things that make people happy and other things that don't make people happy. And what he wants to do right now is just get re-elected. And so he's not interested in a budget that shows his hand. That's why you haven't seen a real plan from him to save Medicare, for example. Instead, what you see is divisive rhetoric designed to pit Americans against each other in a calculated effort to reach 51% or 50% plus one and, and win re-election. Um, and so I'm not surprised that, that they don't want to see a budget passed. Um, because right now they're not really interested in tackling the major issues. They're more interested in creating the environment to get reelected. Um, Senator, um, when in your race you ran in our state as a unapologetic con conservative, and it was very, very clear. And there's a lot of debate this year about electability and what is needed to sell the conservative message to the American public. Um, what do you think specifically made the conservative message that you were putting forward work so well in that race, and what advice would you give for candidates this year? The reason why conservatism works is because that's what most people believe. If you ask most people, they will tell you, yes, government should not spend more money than it takes in. Yes, we need government services and we need government to be involved in society, but it should not be the most important institution in society. By and large, people want to be left alone to, to pursue their dreams, their hopes, and their aspirations. They believe America should be the strongest country in the world. They believe America should have the strongest economy in the world. And they believe America should have the strongest military in the world. That's the core of conservatism. And, um, and that's what most Americans believe. So when we lose is we either start apologizing for those things or we allow our opponents to redefine what conservatism is. But at its core, conservatism is what the vast majority of Americans believe. And here's how I know it. You ready? How come liberals will never admit that they're liberals? They've, they've, they've even made up the word progressive to cover up. Conservatives, Republicans always are fighting over who's the conservative. Isn't every Republican primary come down to who's more like Ronald Reagan? How come no one's fighting about who's more like Jimmy Carter? <laughs> So it, that, the reason is that most Americans are conservatives, are, are, are center-right conservatives who believe in limited government and, 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 and in the principles we believe in. So when we're proud about those things, we win. But when we somehow are ashamed of those things and allow our opponents to redefine them, we lose. Are you ready to endorse a candidate for president? No, not today. Senator, on, on that note, you your state the Florida just primary came through a brutal <laughs> primary, and there seems to be a tremendous, without being candidate specific, there seems to be a tremendous gap growing between what you might call the base, what you might call the Republican Party, 
you have any, any thoughts? That, I mean, that happens every primary cycle. That's why we have primaries. That's why this, and I, it'll be covered like a sport and it'll be really interesting. And then here's what will happen at some point, certainly by August, we will have a nominee. And then there'll be a very clear choice in America. In one corner will be Barack Obama, a man who has presided over making everything worse in America. A president who has, no, has offered no real ideas about how to solve the major issues confronting our country asking for a four-year extension after four losing seasons, and an alternative, who hopefully will be someone that will offer sure. a very clear alternative. And when Americans have that choice between those two things, if, that was the, if that's what the election is about, mm -hmm. a choice between Barack Obama's record and his, plan, and his lack of plans for the future, and a clear alternative, Barack Obama's going to lose. So you don't particularly see this season as any different or more? Well, there's just more money, there's more attention, there's more modes of communication, there's more people you know, mm -hmm. uh, the, the people have always had opinions about politics. The difference is now you have more ways to express it. We didn't have Twitter, Facebook, and social media. None of you guys existed 20 years ago in the realm of, <laughs> of where you're operating now. So that's obviously changed the attention that's paid to politics and the rhetoric that surrounds it. But uh, the choice, the fundamental choice at the end of the cycle is going to be the same. And, um, and uh, the other thing we need to expect and begin to line up is the fact that you're going to have an extremely negative campaign. Barack Obama in 2008 ran... Uh, spent more money on negative attacks than anybody who's ever ran for office in the United States, period. And we can expect more of the same. Basically an all-out assault on the, in the character of whoever his opponent may be because he cannot win on his record, he cannot win on his ideas, so he's going to have to win by eviscerating whoever his opponents are personally. And for all the talk of hope and change, his campaign in 2008 and I expect in 2012 will be nothing less than all-out you know, personal attacks and, and the personal evisceration of his opponents. What's the chances um, that the Senate uh, would pass, and uh, I assume the House would accept, uh, a substitution for the defense sequestration, which the Secretary of Defense has already said uh, would be... Yeah, I was in Munich this weekend at the security conference, and he stood up at the podium and basically said there is no way to comply with the sequester. I mean, not without eviscerating the American defense system. So this, the, 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 fact, the fact of the matter is that... it. It's the reason why I voted against the whole debt limit deal. It was poorly constructed, and the, the number they came up with for the defense sequestration was put in there because they, they knew it was you couldn't comply with it. They knew you couldn't do it. They thought it would be so painful and so catastrophic that it would force the Congress to come up with a deal on the debt limit stuff. So, um, but it was never meant to be complied with. It, it just doesn't, it, you just can't do it. Now, on the, on the, it just related to those two things, um, on the argument that Reid is making for saying why there's no need for a budget is precisely because of the debt limit deal and the idea that that set the budget, the, the budget spending levels, and that essentially a budget resolution is non-binding anyway, it's just to set the budget levels, which is achieved by the right. debt limit increase. First, you know, what do you think about that argument? And secondly, do you see, is there pressure from leadership to essentially, during an election year, not relive the kind of government shutdown or debt ceiling yeah. fight and just go along with, you know, in the fiscal year 2013 budget, just go along with what was set at the debt ceiling thing and not look for further reductions beyond what was already agreed to? To your first point, let me just tell you, I am very grateful that I have not been here long enough to think that that kind of thought process that you just laid out that Senator Reid is advocating is normal. Um, everybody I know, and every person that I, even the most disorganized individuals that I know all have budgets. Every family I know has a budget. Every business I know has a budget. Every entity that I deal with has a budget. The idea that somehow the most powerful government in the history of the world, that runs the most powerful military in human history does not have a budget. I, I just think that's weird. I'm sorry, I just don't understand how you do that. And, and, um, and so I really don't understand the logic of it. As far as the notion that we're going to somehow cave on these issues because we don't want a government shutdown, I've never, no one here advocates a government shutdown, but we are headed towards the ultimate government shutdown, the mother of all government shutdowns, when we run out of money. And, um, and, and that is where we are headed quickly. We are, these sovereign debt crises where people stop buying your bonds uh, and start demanding higher yields, meaning higher interest rates on the amount of money that they're letting you borrow, that stuff happens quickly. There's no way to predict it. It just happens. And you need to look no further than what the European Union is struggling with to realize that that's where we're headed, period. 
And so the mother of all government shutdowns will be the day we can't borrow money anymore or the day that, we, that we're paying so much money on the interest. We have to borrow money just to pay the interest on the money that we're borrowing. And that's where we're headed, period. You know, think about Medicare for a second, an important program in my state. Medicare is going bankrupt. Anyone who's in favor of not doing anything about Medicare is in favor of bankrupting Medicare. And these guys have no plans. He's been president now for three years. Two of the three years, his party controlled both chambers of Congress. And they have not come up with a plan to save Medicare, which is the driver of the debt, which is an important program for millions of Americans who have been promised it's going to be there for them when they retire, like my mom. That's outrageous. How do you justify that? So just to clarify, for fiscal challenges, you, you'd support fighting for lower spending than the current baseline after the budget? We have to get, look, you cannot deal with, you can't solve the debt limit in one year. But we have to put this government on a, on, a, on, a sustainable, on a sustainable spending path so that over the next few years we begin to bring the debt down to a percentage of GDP that's normal and sustainable. That's what we need to be working towards. But what I'm trying to tell you is, ultimately, you can't do that by just looking at discretionary spending. You cannot do that. We cannot put this country on a path towards a sustainable spending level without saving Medica Medicare, without dealing with the drivers of our debt. And foreign aid is not the driver of our debt. And military spending is not the driver of our debt. And roads and bridges are not the drivers of our debt. We should spend money smartly on all those things. But that's not what's driving the debt. What's driving the debt are these programs that are running out of money, that, don't, that are spending more than they take in. And if you do that long enough, you go broke. And that's why we have to deal with that. And this president has no ideas about how to do it. His only idea is, let me wait for Paul Ryan or someone else to come up with an idea, and I'll attack them politically and personally. That's the only thing they do about these things.